Vince Sergi Plochi, who is a highly requested expert in these days of the Russian war of aggression on Ukraine, to open our newly colloquium with, um, with his lecture. Sergei Plochi is the Mikhailo Khrushchevsky Professor of Ukrainian History and also the Director of the Ukrainian Research Institute at Harvard University. This is one of the very few centers outside Ukraine where intensive research on Ukrainian history has been conducted already for decades. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I say that Sergei Plochi is one of the most important international experts on Ukrainian history, and also one of the most prolific writers in, in this field. His uh, new book on the Russian war against Ukraine, entitled um, Der Angriff, has just been published in German, and he is currently on a reading tour in, in Berlin. Allow me to briefly introduce Sergei Plochi to, to you once again, though many of, of, uh, of you um, will already know him. Originally an early modern historian, Sergei Plochi has written important works on the history of the Ukrainian Cossacks, among them um, his monograph, The Cossacks and Religion in Early Modern Ukraine, published at um, Oxford University Press in 2002. He has also written important works and uh, issues of nation building and the history of historiography in Ukraine. In recent years, he has also turned increasingly to 20th century history, publishing books on the end of the Soviet Union and the Chernobyl disaster, for example, or also on the history of Soviet American entanglements during World War II. The list of his, his books is, is really impressive and, and very long and thematically very broad. And um, I would like to, to mention um, two more of his um, recent works from uh, this multitude of, um, of publications and monographs, namely um, um, the book, um, um, the important book uh, with the title, The Gates of Europe, um, A History of Ukraine. Uh, which was published in 2015 and has a very um, um, interesting um, new view on the history um, of Ukraine. Uh, and also his book uh, with the title The Frontline, Essays on Ukraine's Past and Present, published in 2021, shortly before um, this um, horrible uh, war of aggression against Ukraine began um, uh, at Harvard University Press. Um, these books are also uh, tra already translated into, into German, as you, as you might know. Mm -hmm. Sergei Ploche has received uh, numerous awards for his books, but he has also a very interesting biography himself. He was born in Russia to Ukrainian parents. He studied history at the universities of Dnipropetrovsk and Moscow. He received his PhD from the National Taras Shevchenko University in Kiev in 1990. And he later taught as a professor, first at the University of Dnipropetrovsk in Ukraine, then from 1996 onward at the University of Alberta in, in Canada. And since 2007, he has been a professor of Ukrainian history and director of this important Ukrainian research institute at Harvard University. So, dear Sergei, we are very pleased that you will now share with us your perspectives as a historian on the current Russian war of aggression, which, which shocks us on a daily basis and has also led to, histor to a historical turning point in Europe. Well, uh, uh, Professor Penker, thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction and thanks, thanks again for this invitation. It's, it's a pleasure to um, really participate in your in your um, seminar colloquium, and um, I probably we corresponded about that, but I didn't realize that that it's an opening lecture. So I'm I'm especially pleased and honored to to perform that role, to perform that function. Um, the um, uh, lecture that you will hear now, it's based on my research on the book that was uh, just released in, uh, in, uh, here in Germany. 
uh, it's it's a very at least in my experience a very unique case when the translation is being released earlier than the original the book was written in uh, English and the German edition is first the English will be released on the May 16th in, in UK and also in the United States of America so I, I feel um, really, really again pleased and honored by the attention that was paid to, to um, uh, my work by the uh, by the German uh, publishers. Uh, that being said, I also understand that this translations is or and are the, of my previous books. They are part to the enormous growing interest in the in the war. And uh, um, my hope is that if there is L L L any silver lining in, in, in the war, that one thing that it will uh, help with would be to production and spread of knowledge about Ukraine and the region as a whole. And that's that's where I see my my role, my mission uh, today, also to um, use the, the this situation. I wish it would be under different circumstances, but clearly there is. There is interest in the in the uh, region to use it to um, really introduce the world uh, to invite Europe to invite Germany to engage in in thinking about Ukraine and not not only in the context of the war but also historically. Now we are we are where I really uh, wanted wanted us to be. So this history, uh, what, what I'm going to talk about will be history through the eyes of a historian. And this war is really has history written over it in, in, in many, many ways. From the um, use and abuse of history to justify the, the, the start of the war, to the uh, impact on, on the developments that are truly historic uh, that it already has, and we can identify that. And uh, finally, another uh, another way how historian can contribute to understanding the war is looking for the for the sources and the countdown to the war. Um, so this uh, this are three areas that I'll I'll try to to cover. I'll talk about uses and abuses of history. I'll discuss the um, um, road to the war. Uh, as it can be seen and understood by a historian. And finally, I'll talk about the impact, the, the long-term impact of the war, the way how I see it. I start with this uh, image by of, of uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, and uh, he really is the main uh, contributor, not just to the start of the war, in many ways, the author of the war, but also a key figure in trying to provide um, historical foundations for, 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 the, for the war and for the aggression against Ukraine. Uh, there were rumors and reportage that you know, Putin himself was interested in history. And uh, by uh, the summer of uh, 2021, uh, so a little bit more than six months before the start of the war, he published under his name um, essay, uh, I would say sort of historical essay called On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And again, we, we don't know exactly what is happening in Kremlin, but the, 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 the rumor mill suggests that he not just added his name to the text, that he was really actively involved in its creation. Uh, confirmation of that came also a few days before the start of the war, when on February 21st, 2022, on the occasion of uh, Russian withdrawal from the Minsk agreements, uh, Vladimir Putin gave a long, long uh, speech that was dubbed by many as the history lecture. Uh, so what was what was uh, Mr. Putin's argument? Uh, it, it is very clear formulated already in the first paragraph, if not first sentences of the essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And Putin writes that he kept repeating for a long period of time that Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people. And uh, he looked he looked at the um, 
that essay as an opportunity to provide provide more argumentation and more historical argument uh, in, in that regard. The claim that Russians and Ukrainians were one and the same people, one could hear that from Putin already from the year 2013, when together with Patriarch Kirill of Moscow, he visited uh, Kiev, attended a conference organized for, for, uh, by the Orthodox Church at that time, and really, really put forward that, that phrase. Uh, the, the, the phrase and the idea that uh, Russians and, and Ukrainians are one and the same people, the meaning of it, it's, it's very, very particular and we now understand it. The meaning is not that uh, Russians are really Ukrainians. Uh, the, the argument is that Ukrainians are really Russians and, and don't, don't exist as a nation or don't have the right to exist as a nation. And that certainly was not just a historical, but also a political claim. And as we understand now, it was laying foundations, laying ground for the, for the start of the war in terms of its legitimization in historic terms. Um, in my mind, there is no doubt that actually Putin believes in what he was writing and he, what, what he was saying. He repeated that again and again. Um, but the, the uh, also obvious, at least to me as a historian who was working on the um, 18th and 19th century history, not only of Ukraine, but also of Russia and Russian empire, that uh, this idea is not particularly original. And uh, it comes uh, from, the, from the relatively deep imperial past, uh, certainly from the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, Russian, Russian imperial thought. And uh, that's, that's the, the posture that um, really uh, illustrates, if not proves, uh, the, the fact that the idea of the Russians and Ukrainians being one and the same people is certainly much older than than the, the um, Mr. Putin himself or or the the uh, Russia as it emerged um, uh, into existence as a new state after after the fall of the Soviet Union. What you see on this map is a pictorial representation of the idea of the three partite uh, Russian nation. At the center is a woman who symbolizes great Russia or Russia of today. To her right is a woman who represents uh, little Russia uh, as it was, as Ukraine was known in the official imperial discourse of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. And finally, white Russia or Belarus. Um, it, it is uh, very clear that the, the symbol is there to represent the Trinity, the, the unity of the Trinity, but it's also very clear who is, who is in charge, who is running the show. Um, a woman with the cross and, and the woman with the sword is not someone who can be uh, misunderstood and misinterpreted as Ukraine or Belarus. It is very clear, great Russia. It is Russian. Um, the, the model of the three partite Russian nation came into existence in the middle 19th century. And that was a reaction to the rise of the, uh, not so much Belarusian, but to the rise of the, of the Ukrainian national movement with the claim made uh, on the basis of language and culture that Ukrainians were certainly separate from Russians. And the uh, empire responded to that in the middle of the 19th century by formulating the idea of the three partied nation. Yes, Ukrainians maybe uh, speak uh, a different dialect, maybe they, 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 they dance uh, uh, funny dances, maybe they're excellent singers, but, but uh, at, the, at the end of the day, they're part of a bigger Russian nation. That was the symbol. So we recognize some cultural differences, but also we claim the, the, uh, the belonging of uh, the uh, so-called Middle Russian tribe and White Russian tribe or Belarusian tribe to the, to the concept of big Russian nation. The um, idea of the three partite nation didn't survive uh, the Russian empire itself. 
it, 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 it uh, really uh, fell apart together with Russian empire falling apart. Today we um, mark the end of a number of empires pointing to World War I and the impact that it had on the world. The Austria-Hungary is certainly one of them. The Ottoman Empire, another empire in the region is, is one as well. We, we tend to forget and overlook that the Russian Empire had effectively fell apart as well. And it was then brought together and stitched together by the Bolsheviks who uh, combined the military force, who combined violence to bring uh, back the, the under one control the former imperial space, they combined force and violence with concessions to the, to the nationalities. And um, one of those concessions was recognizing of Ukrainians and Belarusians as being not just um, uh, sub, subdivisions of Russian nation, but as being separate nations in, the, in their right. And um, the, the, at least on, on, the, uh, symbolic, on, the, on the symbolic level, uh, that uh, was um, represented in the structure of the Soviet Union with um, at the end of the life of the Soviet Union is 15 different republics. Um, and um, you know, also in imposters of that time. So you see here Joseph Stalin being, being the father of the nations, the leader of the, of the, of the socialist nations. Um, and uh, that is that it was pretty much the um, official Soviet policy through the most of the of the Soviet history. There were all sorts of terrible things happening, like uh, uh, Great Ukrainian Famine, Holodomor. There were Great Terror. There were um, many many things that that really pointed to the. Um, you know, uh, to the uh, really the, the 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 crimes of the dictatorial regime, but one thing remained remained unchanged until the end of the Soviet Union, and to a degree contributed to the Soviet collapse. And this is the recognition of the separateness of the uh, different nations, of uh, endowing those nations with um, their territories and and uh, institutions. Now, uh, Vladimir Putin in his, in his um, essay and his remarks and remarks in particular has been very critical about Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin as well. And his argument has been that it's the Bolsheviks that really created Ukraine, that Lenin was the founding father of Ukraine. Well, the truth couldn't be further from that sort of misreading of history. Because uh, what we know about Vladimir Lenin is that he actually started the war on independent Ukraine in January of 1918. So his goal was not to go to independent Ukraine and, 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 and create that state. His goal was to crush that state. But the Bolsheviks, on the other hand, were actually uh, flexible enough to understand the importance of the national question in the revolution of 1917. The revolution of 1917 is very often referred in historiography as Russian revolution, which is misleading. That was a revolution in the Russian empire. And it was also a revolution of nations on many levels that produced, produced the, the first independent states whose independence was taken away by the Bolsheviks and they were, they were turned into the Union Republics. So that's, that's, that's the very short summary of uh, um, the, the, the nationality question uh, uh, during the Soviet uh, during the Soviet period, I would be more than happy to go into more detail in the Q and A. Uh, but uh, for now, what I want what I want to state is that uh, the new Russia, the Russia that started the, the war in Ukraine, certainly rejected the Soviet model of dealing with the nationalities and goes back and went back all the way to the imperial models, imperial rhetoric, and I would say imperial thinking, because the one, uh, one uh, obvious thing is that the war or the so-called special military operation 
didn't go well as planned. And it was planned that the Ukrainians who are really Russians, who were somehow uh, hijacked and, and, and kidnapped and kept hostages by the Ukrainian nationalists and Nazis led by Volodymyr Zelensky, that they would actually welcome the Russian troops as liberators, that they would welcome them with flowers. And a big part of this, of this um, uh, um, thinking and expectation on the part of the Russian leadership was based on misreading of history, not just bad, bad intelligence, uh, not just wishful thinking, but also a particular paradigms and models of thinking about relationship between Russians and Ukrainians that go back to the to the imperial uh, to the imperial times. The irony of the situation is that the Soviet Union was dissolved by the representatives of the very same uh, allegedly constituent members of the Russian nation that we saw at the image, we saw at the poster coming from 19th century. So what you see here is the signing documents on the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December of 1991. Uh, Boris Yeltsin uh, is, uh, at least in, in the way how I see the screen, he is on the right, the leadership of the Belarus, um, uh, the uh, Speaker of the Parliament, Stanislav Shushkevich, is in the center, and um, uh, to, to, to the right of Shushkevich and on, on the left for me is the President of Ukraine, Leonid Kravchuk. Um, the uh, Soviet Union was dissolved by the leaders of the uh, allegedly Russian tribes of the 19th century, one week after the Ukrainian referendum that took place on December 1st, 1991, where uh, more than 90% or 92% of those who participated in the referendum voted for uh, for independence and independence of Ukraine. And um, the, the turnout was over 80%. So the, the, the vote was very, very representative in that way. Um, <clears throat> uh, the question is why, why uh, one week later, these leaders get together and sign these documents and dissolve the Soviet Union? Because the question that Ukrainians answered at their referendum in December, on December 1st, 1991, was not whether they wanted to dissolve the Soviet Union or not. The question was whether you approve the decision of the Ukrainian parliament of Verkhovna Rada to declare Ukrainian independence. So very limited, the idea is, okay, whether you want Ukraine to leave the Soviet Union or not, not what, what would happen to the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union was, was uh, dissolved one week after that. There has been a number of reasons for that. One reason is that neither Gorbachev nor Yeltsin imagined the Soviet Union, which was considered to be an economic burden on Russia, to continue with that project without the second largest Soviet economy and leg uh, uh, second largest uh, Soviet um, republic and population after Russia, because that was the position that was, was held by Ukraine. Um, uh, there was also cultural and, 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 and religious argument. Um, Boris Yeltsin uh, more than once told the president of the United States, uh, Judge H.W. Bush, um, that uh, um, Russia would recognize Ukrainian independence uh, because without Ukraine, Russia would be outnumbered and outvoted in the Union without Ukraine by representatives of the um, Muslim republics. So um, the argument was not so much economic as it was uh, cultural uh, that uh, uh, Russia would not keep to be, will be comfortable in the Union that is not led by the but by Slavs at the end and, and um, uh, representatives of Christian, of, of Eastern Christian tradition. Uh, why, the, why this is important, no matter whether we, we uh, take the uh, Yeltsin's words at, at face value or he was using the 
the argument about the Muslim republics uh, to explain the situation to Bush, and Bush, of course, was was involved in the uh, in the war in Iraq around that time. So we don't know that. But what what we know for sure that whatever argument you take, Ukraine turned out to be a very important part for the story of the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I would go further than that and would say that Ukraine would also become a, a very important factor in any attempts of Russia to reinstate its control over the post-Soviet space. And the attempts to re reinstate that control, they started already there at uh, that meeting in Belavezha in December of 1991. Because the three leaders not only dissolved the Soviet Union, they also created a Commonwealth of Independent States. And Yeltsin explained to the, to the Russian parliament at that time in December, it seems to me December 11th of 1991, and they sound, signed those documents on December 8th. He explained the need to sign an agreement on the Commonwealth of Independent State by saying that that was the only way to maintain the unity of the space that was created by the generations of the Russian uh, political leaders from the Russian Empire on for centuries. It seems to me he, he, he said that, uh, not, not using exactly the words that I'm using, but he was saying that, that the unity of that space was created over, over the period of centuries. Now, Ukraine had a very different view on the Commonwealth of Independent States and a very different expectations. In Ukraine, the Commonwealth of Independent States was not viewed as an instrument that would allow Russia to continue control over Ukraine, but it was viewed as an institution that would allow what in Ukraine was known and was referred at that time as a civilized divorce. And this, this tensions between Russia and Ukraine, the two largest two post-Soviet states, um, it continued through the entire period of the 1990s and then into the, into the new century and the new millennium. Um, Ukraine that uh, signed documents um, establishing the Commonwealth of Independent States never formally joined the Commonwealth of Independent States. So that, that's, that's, that, 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 that is quite a paradox right there. And uh, from the very beginning, you see all sorts of tensions between Russia and Ukraine on a variety of issues, including territorial issues. Issues of Crimea come to the fore already in 1992, the division of the um, uh, Soviet heritage, uh, and in that particular case, the uh, Black Sea fleet, whether it should go to, to Russia or to Ukraine, it was eventually divided. Uh, the uh, future of the um, uh, nuclear weapons that Ukraine inherited from the Soviet Union, it was in possession, in physical possession of the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. So all of that really, really presented, uh, presented enormous challenges in the 1990s to the Russian-Ukrainian relations. And the treaty uh, recognizing the borders, Ukrainian borders and Russian borders, the treaty de facto recognizing Ukraine in, the, in its borders of 1991 was signed only in, and then, uh, then ratified by the parliament only in the year 1998, seven years, seven years after the formal dissolution of the Soviet Union which again, that, that lag in time also is, is one of indicators how, how uneasy the process of quote unquote divorce between the two largest republics was happening. But at least through the 1990s, it was, if not fully civilized, at least, at least it was partially peaceful. But it would change, it would certainly change with the start of the new millennium. And uh, with arrival in um, main office in Moscow, in Kremlin, of Vladimir Putin. Uh, many things about the Russian policy that we see today are attributed uh, uh, to Vladimir Putin solely or as or treated as part of, of his 
of his tenure. And uh, in many cases, this is, this is absolutely a right and correct attribution. Uh, but the idea that uh, Russia should uh, maintain control over the post-Soviet space is not Putin's. Certainly that was part of thinking already of Boris Yeltsin and his, and his allies. As early as 1991, the, the argumentation was already that, well, for now, Russia would have to focus on itself to use its process for oil and gas to rebuild itself. And within roughly 20 year period, the Republic somehow would come back to Russia one way or another. The expectation was that would happen voluntarily. And that was, that was Yeltsin's belief and very much Yeltsin's policy at that time to maintain this control, but mostly through peaceful and economic, economic means. Uh, Yeltsin differently treated the issue of the autonomous republic within the Russian Federation. So we had two wars in the 1990s, uh, those the so-called Chechen wars. But there was no case of using the military force outside of the borders of the Russian Federation. So what really Putin brings to the table, what is new compared to, to Yeltsin's time is actually extending the military option as the way to solve Russia's problems, extending it and using the military force, not just within the Russian Federation, to deal with the uh, national liberation movement of the of Chechens of the early 1990s, but also to deal with the with the uh, attempt on on part of Ukraine, but also other countries like Georgia, to leave the Russian sphere of influence. So that's that's where the real the the, the real contribution comes. Um, now uh, <clears throat> there has been a lot. A lot of uh, discussion, especially in the um, uh, uh, during the period leading to the war, uh, about the the role of NATO and whether expansion of NATO um, eastward had had provoked provoked the the war. Uh, did it provoke or it didn't provoke? I will be happy to talk about uh, about that in in more detail. So for now, I will make just one one uh, substantive comment on that on that issue and on that question. And um, I will uh, make it by looking or rather putting the chronology straight, and that means chronology of this war. We are very often talk uh, about this war, including I, I catch myself doing that again and again, as something that started in February of 2022. The war really started in February of 2014 with the Russian military takeover of the uh, building of the Crimean parliament and uh, building of the Crimean government. It was a military operation. At that point, it was a, spe a special military operation that didn't um, that, that that went according uh, according to the plan, uh, unlike the the um, Moscow's plan, unlike the the special military operation of 2022. But why it was there? Why it happened? What was there in the time? Well, the, the 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 crisis and then the Russian aggression were uh, um, preceded by the Ukraine's insistence on signing association agreement with European Union. Once under Russian pressure, the Ukrainian government uh, decided not to sign the association agreement. What you saw were mass protests on Maidan, the so-called uh, Euro revolution that later became known as Revolution of Dignity. Uh, the President Yanukovych, who under pressure from Moscow refused to sign association agreement, had to flee. Um, what, what followed next was Russian annexation of the Crimea, start of the hybrid war in Donbass, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, why? Why did that happen? The, the issue that was on the table, that was being decided, was not Ukraine's membership in NATO. It was not Ukraine's membership in the European Union. It was not even the status of the candidate member of the European Union that Ukraine recently got 
less than less than a year ago. It was association agreement, but if Ukraine signs association agreement and it did that, uh, the membership, the, the signing of association agreement would make it not eligible to join any other union, political, economic, or otherwise. And Mr. Putin's project at that time was building of Eurasian Union as the foundation for the reestablishment of Russian status as a great power, as one of the poles in the multipolar world. And multipolar polar world was the, the, the mantra, the, 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 the platform, the position of the Russian foreign policy since, since the beginning of the 1990s. The, the trick is that reestablishing in, in a meaningful way the control over the post-Soviet space and building Russia as one of the poles in the world on par with European Union and China is, is physically impossible without getting control and getting on board the second largest post-Soviet country, uh, 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 largest post-Soviet economy, population-wise, and so on and so forth. So um, the, 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 the foundations of this war are really in the attempt of um, uh, Kremlin to keep under his control the uh, sphere of influence in, in the post-Soviet space. Uh, not not concerned about NATO. That's where, where I started this argument. Because if it would be concerned about NATO, what we would see today when Finland joined NATO and Russian-Finnish border, uh, Russian-NATO border rather, doubled in its length. If NATO would be a real threat, you would see mass withdrawal of the Russian troops today from Ukraine and their redeployment on the border with Finland, but nothing of the sorts is happening. NATO is not a real threat, at least is not perceived as a real threat, or is not perceived as a media threat. Um, the 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 uh, issue is about is is about the the the, the uh, reestablishing of the uh, Moscow's control over the post-Soviet space, which brings me back to the to the idea of empire. Uh, imperial resurgence, imperial ideology. That's that's where I started, <clears throat> and th th that's where I started this uh, presentation. Um, Ukraine's Ukraine's uh, desire to move closer to the European Union, uh, really, in that sense, uh, served as a trigger for the start for the start of the war back in 2014. Ukraine, uh, in its relation to Europe and European Union, is quite a unique place, not just in Europe, but in the world. This is the only country, the only place, as far as I know, where people were prepared to risk their lives and indeed lost their lives under the banner of European Union. At the time when there was, of course, a growing skepticism toward all European project and, and European, uh, European Union project in particular. Um, this is this is the map, the map of of Ukraine. Uh, the um, Crimea was uh, taken over, and next integrated into the uh, Russian Federation on the basis of the uh, referendum that no no one was at least in, from the independent observers was allowed to to come and monitor. And uh, uh, one, once Ukraine refused after the Crimea to succumb to the, to the Russian dictate and the demand was to produce so-called federalization of Ukraine, really be, behind the term federalization was really the, the meaning was uh, confederation with no single, no, no mm, uh, mm, Possibility for the for the centralized government to decide foreign policy because the according to the Russian scenario each of the federal regions of Ukraine was supposed to uh, have the right to engage in its own 
um, trade relations, international relations, and so on and so forth. Uh, Ukraine refused to do that. And then the next stage, a few months later, was the start of the hybrid warfare in Donbass. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion in literature whether it's, it's, it's a civil war or not civil war. Again, I will not go into too much detail now, but I can tell you that the, the situation in which the puppet state called the um, Donetsk People's Republic has uh, as its prime minister, the person who grew up and spent all his previous life in Moscow, and when the so-called minister of the defense of that uh, so-called republic, Mr. Girkin, is also a, a person born and, and, and raised in Moscow who never stepped on Ukrainian soil a few weeks before the start of the aggression, that at least in my mind put serious, uh, serious question marks next to the question of, of how, whether that was civil war or that was, that was a result of the, of the different form of aggression by Russia. Uh, <clears throat> the Minsk agreements that were signed in the year 2014 and 2015 uh, really were there to implement the uh, uh, Vladimir Putin's vision of the federalization of Ukraine. So the idea was that um, uh, the uh, so-called elections of the sort that we had in the Crimea with the referendum would be held in, in Donbass in eastern part of Ukraine under the Russian control. And after that, those republics would be pushed into the um, legal, uh, legal um, body framework uh, of, of Ukraine uh, as the result of the change of the con Ukrainian constitution. And the current war came in February of 2022, after Russian withdrawal from the, this Minsk agreements of 2014 and 2015. Um, as the result of uh, many things, but one of them was certainly a realization in Kremlin that um, the hopes for the new president, um, an experienced um, um, TV personality, uh, now known all over the world as Volodymyr Zelensky, that uh, Zelensky would be incapable to, to really become a, an effective president, that Zelensky would agree to the uh, Russian formula of the Minsk agreements, that, uh, that hope didn't materialize. And uh, Vladimir Putin actually directly writes about that in his essay on um, uh, the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians that uh, um, parties change and, and leaders change in Ukraine, but the system is of the sort that uh, it, it doesn't matter. The, 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 new, the new leaders uh, keep, keep continuing with the same course and the, the course was really uh, getting further away from Russia and closer, closer to the West. Uh, Vladimir Putin called that um, that particular development, uh, a project of creating anti-Russia in Ukraine. Uh, th there is a lot of attempts to explain, explain um, the war by pointing just at Mr. Putin or pointing at the, let's say, isolation of the Russian leader during, during the, um, the COVID uh, period. And uh, there is some, some uh, plausibility in, the, in, the, in that sort of explanations. But as a historian, I'm also looking at the long-term trends. And uh, what I see there and, uh, is, is a certain logic. Again, it's, it's, very, it's very imperialistic logic, but certain logic and continuity between, uh, between the, the Russian policies of the 1990s and then the policies, the the, the start of the war in 2014 and renewal of the war on a very different scale, very different scale in February of 2022 as all out war. 
Uh, here, I guess I uh, will turn to another uh, to another part of my presentation, and that will be the final part of the presentation. I promised you that I would talk about the uses and abuses of history. Uh, I, I certainly tried to cover that angle that I would talk about the roots and preconditions of this war, the road to the war. And uh, my, my uh, third and last promise was to talk about the um, uh, consequences and the impact of this war uh, that uh, will, have, will have major um, repercussions in the future. And uh, one of this, um, Impacts is, is um, linked, uh, directly connected with the uh, use not just of nuclear weapons, but of nuclear energy in this war. The weaponization of what was known as atoms for peace. Uh, we see the, the first case, the first war in, in history of Europe or the world in general, where that sort of weaponization is taking place in the middle of the war. The war starts on February 24th, 2022, with Russia taking over control over the um, Chernobyl nuclear site. Then Russia withdraws in, in late March as the result of the collapse of its attempt to and, and military operation uh, around Kiev, an attempt to take, to take the Ukrainian capital. But in early March, Russians took over as the result of the battle after firing missiles takes over control over the largest nuclear power plant in Europe, the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. And um, it continues to be, to be a major, major threat uh, of, of accident or not so much accident happening in the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant ever since the March of 2022. Now we talk a lot about the coming Ukrainian counteroffensive, and the idea is that it would probably come in the south of Ukraine, in the south of the country, exactly in the area where the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is located. Uh, Russia ignores the, 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 the demands coming from the international community, including the International Atomic Energy Agency to um, really leave the plant or to turn it into the no, no fight zone. Um, we are here in really uncharted waters in many ways. Uh, I already said that this is the first case of, of that, of, 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 uh, that, 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 that um, particular, particular situation. Uh, the international community turned out to be completely unprepared to deal with, with this threat. The International Atomic Energy Agency had no regulations on what, what the operators are supposed to do. Uh, there are plus minus 440 reactors, uh, active reactors in the, in the world today. None of them was designed to withstand the missile attack or to deal with the conditions of the war. Uh, so um, institutionally, the International Atomic Energy Agency, maximum what it can do is issue resolutions, protests, demands, and pleas. But there is no there is no effective international mechanism to deal with these situations, and uh, this is this will have a major major impact on the, on the future, uh, including thinking about the nuclear energy, how safe it is and how uh, big or, or small, if any, the role of nuclear energy has to be in the, uh, in the uh, projects of fighting, fighting um, uh, climate change. I know that uh, that issue has been, uh, has been discussed in, in Germany and, and uh, Germany made a choice moving away from nuclear energy, but of course next door is France and next door are other countries that are uh, doubling on the, on the nuclear energy in terms of testing efforts and, and uh, in, in terms of the hopes of uh, nuclear energy delivering, delivering the salvation from the, from the coming, uh, coming climate change, if not climate collapse. So this is, this is one of the, of the issues with long-term impact and importance. 
Another one uh, deals with the relations between uh, Russians and Ukrainians. And the future of this idea and concept of Russians and Ukrainians are being one and the same people. What you see here at the screen is a photo taken in March of uh, the last year, when uh, in Ukraine, in Kyiv, they dismantled the monument to the uh, Russian-Ukrainian friendship that was uh, put there in the last, during the last decade of the existence of the Soviet Union. But very interestingly survived the uh, first Russo-Ukrainian war or the, first, the, the annexation of the Crimea and the hybrid war in Donbass. It survived 2014, 2015. And, and lasted into 2022. Um, what we see, again, it's, it's about symbolism, but what, we, what the, the, this image for me at least symbolizes is that uh, there is, there is a, um, in quite amazing level of mobilization of Ukrainian nation against, uh, around, against the aggression, but also around the idea of the Ukrainian political nation that is certainly, certainly very different from Russia. And with the sort of the losses that uh, not just Ukraine, but also uh, Russia suffers in Ukraine, I, mm, it's difficult for me to imagine that this war would not have similar sort of impact on, on Russia and, and Russian national identity. Uh, separating itself, uh, will, uh, willingly or not, from a uh, big part of the imperial legacy, including thinking about Russians and Ukrainians as being, or Ukrainians not existing, or being illegitimate state. Even on the Russia prop uh, propaganda channels today, you see much more implicit respect for the Ukrainian armed forces or for the Ukrainian state in comparison to what you could hear uh, during the first days and weeks of the war. So uh, the, the, the war that was uh, designed to, to allegedly bring the, the, the two nations and the two countries closer is uh, resulting in the creating of a, of a war that will be remembered for generations to come. Another, another uh, impact uh, linked to the, uh, to the divisions in Europe the gray zones in Europe disappear today. And while I am not prepared to, to state that what you see on the screen there, that the Berlin Wall or Iron Curtain of some sort is coming into existence, but certainly there are new divisions emerging in Europe and disappearance of the gray zones as well. With the Russia really reorienting itself uh, in economic terms and political terms away from Europe, and toward the East, China and, and India in particular, both in economic terms, but not only economic. Uh, the posture is from the 1950s, the period of the Soviet-Chinese Soviet, Soviet -Chinese alliance. Uh, there are certain documents claiming that there is a relationship uh, between Russia and China today with, with no limits. Um, the, the, the actual developments on the ground show that there are actually limits uh, to, 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 that, to that sort of relationship. But uh, there is more and more talk about, about uh, po possible, possible uh, full alliance, if not now, then maybe in the future between Russia and China, which would be very different from the one of the 1950s, where the Soviet Union was in the driving seat. Now, clearly, in economic terms, political terms, and otherwise, it's, it's the Chinese that are leading in that, in, in that, uh, in that alliance, and Russia performs um, a secondary, a subordinate role. So, the war that started as the war to assure that Russia uh, establishing or re-establishing control the post-Soviet space would be one of the poles in multipolar world, really lead today to the uh, really recreation of a bipolar world of the Cold War era. One thing that I can say for sure that there will be no repetition of history. History doesn't repeat itself. But history also provides very useful parallels and explains the origins of the developments that we have today. 
And in that sense, in that sense, I think that it, uh, it is one of the very useful instruments, not only for the purposes of research and teaching, but also for engaging in our today's discussions and debates. Setting facts straight, and also provide the explanation that other fields probably, uh, other, other interpretations are not, are not able to, to provide. So I, I uh, despite everything that what is, what is happening in the world today, I am fairly optimistic about, about my field and, and our field if you, are, if you specialize, if you major in, in history, there is an important contribution that we can make. Thank you very much for your attention.